Some things are so undeniably true that we've made them into familiar idioms. For instance, complete these sayings. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? Actions speak louder than words. What goes up must come down. A picture paints a thousand words. Today on Through the Bible Sunday Sermon, Dr. J. Vernon McGee's sermon is a familiar idiom. See if you can complete his title. A chicken always comes home, that's right, to roost, meaning a man's bad deeds always come back to haunt him. Galatians 6 says that what a man sows, that's what he reaps. If you plant corn, you're not surprised when corn grows. If you plant wheat, wheat is what you get. The same is true in our lives. You can expect to reap what you sow, whether that is evil or righteous. We'll be in Genesis today, studying the life of Jacob. You can turn in your Bible to Genesis 29. Now let's pray as we turn our hearts to God's Word. Thank you, Father, that we can learn some lessons vicariously and we don't have to suffer ourselves. Teach us now through your Spirit how to walk uprightly, to sow the fruit that is pleasing to you so that we reap what we can offer back to you in worship. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our subject of the morning is Chickens Come Home to Roost. And the subject hasn't anything in the world to do with our return from Florida, I can assure you. This morning we have a text, and the text is found in the sixth chapter of the Epistle to the Galatians, verses 7 and 8. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, That shall he also reap, for he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. This statement of the Apostle Paul in Galatians is an axiom of life. It's a law of humanity. It's like the law of gravitation. It is one that operates in all the different areas of this world. It's applicable to any sphere or situation or any strata of society. The entire spectrum of life is covered by this law. Move it into any area. Move it into the realm of biology. Go first to botany. And plant life. You sow corn, you get corn. You sow oats, you get oats. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Move it into the realm of zoology, the animal world, and you will find that cows beget cows, lions beget lions. You can take it into the bovine or the canine or the avian family, and you'll find that it works. The chickens come from hen eggs. That's a profound statement to make, I know, but it certainly is a true statement, and I'm not this morning debating whether it was the chicken or the egg first. Since then, it's always been chickens come from hen eggs because... There's a law that operates. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you want turtles, you must have turtle eggs. Now, it is true that pearls do come from oysters, and I heard of a girl that got a diamond from a nut, but that hasn't anything in the world to do with this law, I can assure you, because it still works in all the different departments of life. You take in the realm of political economy, put it on the national level, and go back to the very beginning, and you take that first great world empire. God said through Daniel, you've been put in the balances, weighed in the balances, 
and found wanting. God says, what you sow is a nation that you will reap. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You take it into the spiritual realm, and it's true today for both the saved and the unsaved. It's true of those that are children of God and those that are far from God and without God in the world. The person who is saved does not abrogate this law because he happens to be saved. And by the same token, the person who's unsaved does not abrogate the law at all. It operates in the life of every individual here and has lived on the earth. Haman built a gallows to hang Mordecai on, and he was hanged on that gallows. Justin the apostate, who killed Christians in his army and used the sword to exterminate them, was exterminated by the sword on the battlefield. We were down in New Orleans, and we went through the French Quarter, and they showed us the Napoleon house that's down there. It's not that Napoleon ever lived in that house, because he never did. But it was prepared for him, and it was made ready for him. But he never got there. It was a dream that never did come true, unrealized and unfulfilled. And this man died in loneliness and in bitterness on the island of Elba, never permitted to come, the man that had dashed so many dreams to the ground, the man that had brought disappointment and loneliness to so many people in Europe, it came to him because God says, Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Hitler and Mussolini they probably stirred up more strife and bloodshed in this century than any two men that have lived. And these two men died by violence and bloodshed because you don't break that law even when you're a dictator. Al Capone was the gangster that had a gang that controlled liquor during the Prohibition area and prostitution, especially in Chicago. But a girl took an awful revenge on him, for he died of paresis. Paresis is a softening of the brain caused by syphilis. May I say to you, God says you don't break his law. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. The world outside calls it poetic justice and recognizes it. The poet expressed it like this, There is a destiny that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. The Greeks put it in a bromide like this, The dice of the gods are loaded, and they are, because you don't you don't break this pattern, not in this life. The philosopher has expressed it like this, the fortuitous concurrence of circumstances, and the man on the street just calls it bad luck, but this morning we call it chickens come home to roost. Hamlet, who had seen the disaster and who could say there's something rotten in the state of Denmark, he could say, finally, this young prince, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not placed his cannon against self-slaughter. How stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me the uses of this world. Chickens do come home to roost. Jezebel played fast and loose and thought that she would get by with it, but she didn't get by with it because the prophet had already said the same way in which you took the life of an innocent man and the dogs licked his blood, 
the dogs will actually eat your flesh. And it came to pass the same way. Marilyn Monroe was a sex pot, was an idol of American young girls. May I say to you, she was a suicide, ill-starred. And Bridget Bardot has tried several times to commit suicide because there is a law that operates that God says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Now, this text actually was not given to the unsaved. It wasn't given to the non-Christian at all. It was given for the child of God. That's what Paul means when he's writing to the Galatians. And he follows through by saying to the Christian, if you please, if you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's for the Christian. And if you sow to the Spirit, you shall reap life everlasting. Now, this, this text here is... I think one that is applicable to a man in Scripture as no other man. Jacob is the most conspicuous example that we have in Scripture of the operation of this text. And I want it uh, said right here at the beginning that Jacob was God's man. He was chosen before he was born. He played fast and he played loose with life as others have. But he was God's man through it all. His conduct did not conform to the position that he had before God. But he was God's man. In spite of what he did, and in spite of his life, he's still God's man. But he lived like the devil's disciple. And you begin to see him starting early in life, he bought a birthright from his brother that had already been promised to him, and God would give it to him in his own good time. But why should this young fellow wait when he's sharp enough and he's clever enough and he's crooked enough to get it on his own? And he got it on his own in a way that God could not honor and did not honor. And then he deceived his father at the time of the blessing he pretended to be his eldest son. He went and got a goat, killed the goat, took the smell of it and put it on him and the blood on him and took the goat's skin and put it on top of his hand and let his father feel. He deceived his father. He had no right to do that. And he did all of this. And he seemed to get by with it, and God did nothing. And I think Jacob would have promoted the idea that God is dead. But a day of reckoning was coming. Payday, someday, he fled to the land of Haran. He had to leave home because of Esau. And he came to the house of his uncle Laban. He sought refuge and asylum there. He wanted to wait until the storm blew over at home, and then he'd return. But he moved into a hurricane. But he refused to learn at home. Uncle Laban is going to teach him in a far country. This boy is a prodigal son now, and he runs off to Uncle Laban and expects to be treated well. But uh, Uncle Laban sent him to college. U.H. was the name of the college, not the University of Haran, but the University of Hard Knocks. He spent 20 years in that university, and he graduated magna cum laude. That is Jacob's experience. And he hadn't been there but a month until Uncle Laban said to him, I want to, you to know that I don't want you to work for me for nothing. And who had said anything about working? One thing for sure, this boy hadn't said anything about it. But Uncle Laban says, when you stay with me, you pay your board bill. And I want you to know that I'm going to put you to work. And you'll not work for nothing. And so 
He said, uh, what uh, shall I pay you? And here we start now with the first lesson. And the very interesting thing is he had discovered that this boy had fallen in love with his youngest daughter, Rachel. And so the time came, and he said, I'll, I'll work for her seven years. We are told that those years went by so quickly, and the story goes something like this. We'll let the Spirit of God tell it in Genesis 29, verse 16, and Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. And Jacob loved Rachel and said, I'll serve thee seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. And Laban said, It's better that I give her to thee than that I should give her to another man. Abide with me. And then the loveliest thing that's said about Jacob at this time is this, And Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love he had to her. He loved her, and he worked seven years. Now the day for the, the ceremony has come, and in that day the bride was always brought well-veiled, covered entirely. Uncle Laban knows a few things also. So Uncle Laban shifted girls. And when it says that Leah was tender-eyed, that's just a nice way of saying that she was not very good-looking. And so the thing that happened was he thought he was marrying Rachel, the younger daughter, and he got Leah. And we are told in verse 25, it came to pass that in the morning... Behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve with thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? Listen who's talking. This is the boy that uh, pretended to be the elder son. He was the younger son. He deceived his father... And now he is deceived in the exact way in which he had deceived. Because God said, and you've got to come to the end of the Bible, because if he'd said it at the beginning, you might not have believed it. But now you have too many examples, and God says, Jacob, be not deceived. God is not mocked. You're my man. Whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. If you sow corn, you never get cotton. And in the exact way in which you deceive, that's the way you've been deceived. And he's just now starting to college, by the way. That was his freshman year. He's just now beginning to learn some things. But that night, the honeymoon was over. And he now goes to work again for seven more years for Rachel. And Laban very cleverly said, verse 26, It must not be so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Dear Uncle Laban hadn't told everything. He said, Jacob, there was a little item there that I overlooked. We have a rule and a law in our country that you don't give the younger daughter in marriage before the older daughter. I forgot to tell you that. So you have Leah now. Do you want to serve for Rachel? And you can be sure of one thing, but this is not God's best for this man. And we find now in verse 30 that he loved also Rachel more than Leah. And we are told that there's strife in the family. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister. So that now we have in this home envy and strife. And I say it this morning very kindly, but I want to say it. That home of Jacob 
yonder in the land of Haran that he founded was a hell on earth. Oh, how this man is learning. You don't beat God at his own game. That when God says, if you're going to sow it, you're going to reap it. And I don't care what you sow, God says you'll reap it. And so this boy is learning now. Now he's been a very clever boy. You remember, he bought a birthright, and he got it at a reduced rate. He only gave a bowl of soup for it. Very cheap for what he got. It was a bargain price. But you know, Laban likes bargains also. And will you listen to this poor boy after 20 years? And listen to him as he begins now to cry out, This twenty years have I been with thee. Thy ewes and thy she-goats have not cast their young, and the rams of thy flock have I not eaten. That which was torn of beasts I brought not unto thee. I bear the loss of it. Of my hand didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was. In the day the drought consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from mine eyes. Thus have I been twenty years in thy house. I serve thee fourteen years for thy two daughters, and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages ten times. You talk about having a union. This boy Jacob needed a union to belong to because this man is constantly changing his wages. and He never knows from one day to another what might happen. This man who had bought a birthright, who was clever and slick in that dealing, found out that chickens come home to roost. And now he's being treated the same way. Then we have, I suppose, the the classic example in this man's life. It is the story of Joseph. You will recall that Joseph was his favorite son, the, the boy that he loved because he was the son of Rachel. And his brethren hated him, and you'll recall that they sold him into Egyptian bondage. And then they wanted their father to think that he had been killed. And they took that coat of many colors, and of all things, they killed a goat and dipped it in the blood of the goat. This is the man that took the skin of a goat and deceived his own father. Now as a father, he's deceived the very same way. And it was the saddest day of his life. This man found out that there is an axiom of God that operates, be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And just because he's God's man, he won't escape, especially when he's playing fast and loose. Now, that's not an isolated case in the Word of God. Very briefly, let me mention some others. There's the story of David. David committed an awful sin, and let's not play it down. It was awful. God said it was awful. And why do you think it's awful? Because the Word of God says it's awful, my beloved. But the thing that David did, the king of Babylon did it every day and got by with it, seemingly. But you see, David is God's man. And there stood that man, Nathan, God's prophet, right before him. And, and he tells the story of a man that took a little ewe lamb that belonged to a poor man. And David could see the sin in somebody else, but he couldn't see it in himself. And you know, that's our trouble. We have spiritual astigmatism. We can see where the other man is wrong, but we can't see our own. And so this, this man, David, red-headed fellow that he is, he stands up and he says, If that man's in my kingdom, he shall be punished. Who is he? It took a lot of courage for Nathan to lift his hand and point it and say, Thou art the man. 
It's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O Lord. And so this man David could have had Nathan executed, but he didn't. He went immediately to God in confession. And one of the greatest confessions that's recorded in the Word of God is this confession of David. Psalm 51, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Listen to him again, verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And then listen to him again, Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. He confessed it. But you see, God said, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. David, you can't get by with it. Have you read the rest of David's story? I'm afraid a great many people just see this one blot on an otherwise outstanding life. From that day on, God took him to the woodshed, put the lash on his back, and as far as the Word of God is concerned, he never took the lash off of his back. He had done a disgraceful thing in breaking up another man's home. Read what happened to David's daughter. He did an awful thing in murdering another man. Read what happened to Absalom, the boy he loved above everything else in life. God said, David, you don't get by with it. The interesting thing is I can't find anywhere where David cries out to God. I feel like saying, oh, God, let him alone. You've hit him enough. But David never said that. He said, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. Regardless, I'm coming to you. I want to be right with you. Oh, how we need that deep working of the Spirit of God today in the lives of Christians who are in sin. I tell you, God still has a woodshed, and he still uses it. Then we find this man, David never crying out to God, never did he cry out to God. He's not the only one. You come to the New Testament and somebody says, well, when you get to the New Testament, it's different. No, it's not. Peter says to the Lord Jesus in the upper room, I'll die for you. He denied him that night, denied him three times. But our Lord said, Peter, there's a law that operates. You will be crucified. And he was. Peter, when he was crucified, tradition says, asked that his head be put down. He says, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord died. Paul the apostle stood one day, a young man, and saw another young man, that first martyr of the church, and he's responsible for his death. They put the clothes at the feet of this young Pharisee, Saul. And that young man saw that man stoned to death and gave the word for it. Now on the Damascus road, he comes to Christ and somebody says, well, his sins are forgiven. Yes, they are. He's a child of God. Yes, he is. But you forgot there is a law of God that says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Uh, will he go through that? Yes, he will. Follow him. First missionary journey. Comes to Antioch of Pisidia. And then the hatred is building up against him. And finally the crowd take him out and the mob stones him to death. Was he dead? Listen to him. Second Corinthians 13th chapter, Paul says, I knew a man once. You did, Paul? Who was he? I'm the man. I knew a man once. He was caught up to the third heaven. You mean you were caught up to the third heaven? Yes. When? When they took me outside of Lystra, yonder in the Galatian country, and stoned me to death. Were you dead, Paul? Yes. Did God raise you from the dead? Yes. The young man 
that had seen Stephen stoned to death has the same thing happen to him. We're told today that if we would judge ourselves, we'd not be judged. God says he doesn't want to do this, but if you and I won't deal with that which is wrong in our lives, God will. Where did the prodigal son get his quipping when he came home? No. There was a fatted calf there. There was a robe. There was a ring. There was a banquet. There was joy when he came home. He got an awful whipping in the far country because God says, whatsoever you sow, you're going to reap. Let me come back now with Jacob. There came a day when God closed in with Jacob yonder at the brook Jabbok. I stood there and uh, I thought of that man. He had played fast and loose. He had been a disgrace to God, but he was God's man. He was a prodigal son now coming home. And God says, Jacob, you can't go on living like this. And that night, God moved in on him. A man wrestled with him that night, broke his leg, but God got him that night because he is God's man. This inexorable and inflexible law that knows no exceptions is one of the greatest proofs this morning that God is not dead, my beloved. It's operating today. It operates here in the church of the open door. Just in the apostate I referred to him, oh, how that brutal Roman hated Christians, and he found out that they were in his army. He found out a young commander in his army was a Christian. He brought him in. He took him and flogged him and then ready to kill him. And he said to him, calling him by name, Where is your carpenter now? Justin thought he was dead. And this young officer said, Sir, he's making a coffin for the emperor. And he was. For well, that young man was killed, became a martyr. But the next day out on the field of battle, this man who thought he was invulnerable was mortally wounded. And as he fell on the battlefield, he reached into his breast, which covered with blood, put in his finger and flung it into the air and said, Thou hast won, O Galilean, thou hast won. And he fell back dead because he always wins. The Russians had a crude test. I don't know whether they still use it or not. They did. They'd have the children in school pray to God for bread. Nothing would happen, of course. Then they were to pray to the state and ask Joe Stalin, and then bread was put before them. What did that prove? That didn't prove anything. The dust storms went through the Midwest. Mr. Roosevelt, who was then president, took a trip out through the dust storms area. And when he came to one little town in Iowa, there was a sign up by some wag that said, You gave us beer, now give us rain. My friend, may I say to you, God is not dead. He's still moving, and he's moving in the nations of the world today. We are trying today to build a great society without a so great salvation. We are trying to have peace today without the Prince of Peace. And God says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And my friend, we can't have peace today. We are fighting a war in Vietnam that we don't want to fight. None of us want to fight it. But why are we fighting it? These that are marching don't seem to realize that God says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. After World War II, we became big brother to the world. We sent our dollars abroad to buy friends in peace. We worshiped the almighty dollar, and we thought the world would worship it, but they didn't. They didn't buy our line. We wanted to live in peace and plenty at home, Surfeited with materialism, security in sin was what we wanted. And we forgot God. We did a good job of forgetting Him. Oh, we were religious, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Church membership after the war 
climb like a thermometer in August in a cornfield in Illinois. We produced synthetic saints. They were as phony as $3 bills. And today we have a tremendous church membership all over this land. And right now liberalism is confessing that it is bankrupt today. They humanize the Lord Jesus Christ. They naturalize the Bible. They socialize the gospel. They devitalize salvation, immunize the cross, emasculated regeneration, and fumigated sin. And they reply today redemption as if it's a cosmetic. And we have today Brill Cream Christians. Just a little dab will do you. That's all in the world today. That they are after is just as little as possible. We've forgotten God. What did they do about Watts? We had a powder keg in our own backyard. And when we asked over the radio to help for running a school here in a church, none of that crowd responded because they're bankrupt. Bankrupt liberalism today putting in the dance and jazz in the church because they've lost out, my beloved. What about fundamentalism? Well, we've made quite a few religious clubs today filled with spiritual snobs. We're afraid to venture forth into an evil world today. I have here a letter that was on my desk this morning. It frightened me at first. It comes from the chief of police, Parker. And I wondered, well, I thought they'd caught up with me, but it wasn't on that at all. They have a Los Angeles job course center for women, not for those that are, that, uh, are in trouble with the law, but those that are not delinquent, but rather those that have become dispirited in their previous situation. I haven't had the chance yet to bring this to the staff and the offices, but I hope that somebody's going to venture forth from this place to try to reach these folk. Fundamentalism today needs to begin to reach out, my beloved, and not be satisfied with our little religious clubs today. Where are the Christian laymen today that are taking a stand on moral issues? You don't hear them at all. This chaplain down in Bourbon Street in New Orleans made the headlines. I'm not sure I agree with him on all that he's done, but the thing I've noticed is that he is the only man that's had courage to speak out against immorality in Vietnam today. May I say to you, where are Christians today taking stands on moral issues? Right here in Los Angeles, I noticed coming in yesterday on the train that a politician, and you have to admit he's a politician, running for office, has spoken out against an immoral art display. Why aren't Christians today, individual Christians, speaking out today? Where are the laymen today to stand for God in this hour? We have a lot of Christian chickens, but we do not seem to have the courage today. The only thing we criticize today is the preacher, and we only do that in certain little groups. But we don't take a stand for those things today that Christians should be taking a stand on. Oh, today to get in the arena of life and stand for God. My friend, this morning, God is alive and he's moving in the affairs of the world today. I honestly don't think he's attending church right now. But our Lord said to those religious leaders in his day, and I think he'd say it to us this morning, Ye search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And then that wail that came from his soul, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. And then listen to him. If ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. God is not dead, but you and I are. And life is only through him today. I close. I had the privilege of, while I was away, of doing something that I very seldom am able to do. I was with two millionaires. 
One was in Illinois, a man that met us at the train the other morning at 4.30 in the morning, turned a car over to us. He told me when I was there before his story, he and I sat waiting for the train late at night. He told me how, as a young man, he played fast and loose. And he said, my one desire was to get rich. And he said, I accumulated a fortune, a million dollars. And he lost every dime of it. He became bitter, went into father into sin. And then through a wonderful miracle, he came to Christ. And he says, when I came to him, I no longer wanted to become rich. But he's worth a million today. His friends say in Peoria that he has a Midas touch. Now, I guess he's in a dozen businesses that he can't touch a thing. He doesn't turn to gold. He said to me, oh, how God dealt with me. And then he brought me to himself. You don't beat him. The dice of the gods are loaded. And our God says, don't roll them with me. I know exactly how they're coming up. And they're not coming up in your favor. Don't play with me. Be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. The other man was down in Florida. He's retired, lovely, cultured, refined man and his lovely wife. He told me, he said, I was saved late in life. He never missed a morning service or an evening. He said, I never had Bible study before. Friends, you don't know how wonderful it is to teach folk that have never had Bible study. They came up to me that last evening, and she said to me, tears in eyes, she says, I can't tell you what this week's meant to us. If I did, I'd break down. She gri held onto my hand for a moment, turned and walked away. Then he, in a very wonderful way, he said, you know, I came to God late in life. I look back upon my life in which I spent just making money. Oh, he said, if I could only go back and live it over. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You sow corn, you get corn. You sow oats, you'll get oats. You sow wild oats, and I guarantee you, you'll get wild oats, and you'll get an abundant crop. Chickens do come home to roost. Hmm. If you're hearing this message today, you must ask yourself, what am I sowing, and what am I reaping? Is it a good crop, or is it a crop of consequence? Well, whatever your answer, it's never too late to turn your heart to him right now and ask that he would grow his life in you going forward. As we've said, today's sermon was Chickens Come Home to Roost, and it's available for purchase on a CD or as part of Dr. McGee's 26 sermon series, Going Through Genesis series, available on CDs or MP3 disc. And speaking of Genesis, the Bible bus is traveling through this great book all week on our Daily Through the Bible program. You can join us several different ways on this station, on ttb.org, by podcast, even more. If you'd like help in knowing your best option, then give us a call at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And we can also direct you to Dr. McGee's free notes and outlines on every book of the Bible. And as you know, we love to hear from you and then learn how God's using his word heard on through the Bible in your life. So drop us an email today at BibleBus at ttb.org. Now may the mercy of God and the grace of God keep you in his peace as you walk with your Lord Jesus this week. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.